joining you from Eastern Los Angeles, where it is raining. Can you believe it's actually raining, Katia? I cannot yeah. believe it. Middle of August. Middle of August. Fresquito here at the Performance Center. It is Inside LAFC Podcast. Katia Castorena joining me, Max Pretos. we got a big show. It's the day after a huge win over Real Salt Lake. LAFC move on into the League's Cup quarterfinals. We'll tell you all about it. Two exciting games for LAFC so far in Licks Cup, but Monterrey is up next. We're going to be talking about LAFC's opponent for the quarterfinals at the Rose Bowl. Stick around. It's going to be exciting. I'm excited. We'll let you know all about Monterrey and a very special guest, John Thorrington, co-president and general manager of LAFC, will join us here in our little outdoor studio. Coming your way, Inside LAFC podcast starts right now. And we are off and rolling here on Inside LAFC Podcast. Katia and Max looking back at another triumphant result for LAFC. We were curious about the League's Cup, Katia, about what could come out of it. And if it ends in the quarterfinals, and we'll preview the game against Monterrey, we'll talk to John Thorrington about that as well. We will preview, uh, if, if it doesn't go any further, you get... To get healthy, you get some good games under your belt, and you get to see what you're capable of. Beating FSA Juarez 7-1, beating Real Salt Lake 4 Seto, who were one of the, let's just phrase it this way, going into League's Cup, I thought they were the hottest team in the Western Conference. You get to see what you look like when you flex your muscles because uh, th those were no contests, and Real Salt Lake's a team they could play in the postseason, and if, if that's the way it looks, I don't think... Uh, <laughs> if they can repeat that, I don't think these teams can run with LAFC. We'll see how it looks like, certainly, in November, December. They will most definitely, not to mean any disrespect to what Juarez and RSL are doing, I do agree that RSL had been in a pretty good run, and it's looking great. However, against Monterrey, it will be the toughest challenge that LAFC has faced Thus far, Monterrey is a very good team. We're going to go more in depth against, I mean, about what this opponent means. But the good thing, because here on this podcast, we would say over and over again how the team was tired, fatigued after all those games before the All-Star break. 33 matches. It was a record for this club. They basically played an entire MLS regular season. That's what, that 34 games would be. In just half a year. So it was intense. And you can see it now. That was the question after the break. After having those days off where everybody could recharge, be with their families, not just physically, but like mentally, how would the team look? And hey, we've seen a, the team in great shape so far, scoring goals, seeing that joy again. So that's been great. That spark that is back, what, you know, what we know and what we're used to from this team. We're holding our breaths thinking, like, what will it look like if they now that, hey, you're going to get your break. You're going to get to cambiar las pilas as the... Uh, Menudo, the hit band Menudo back in the day used to sing. I had all their uh, their, their discos. Uh, <laughs> they were able to pull it <laughs> off. Suete a mi moto. I, uh, exactly. That's the one that I know. Don't, no, don't get me started. I know the whole songbook. <laughs> but then we have uh, everyone getting healthy. And in a little bit, we are going to break down what LAFC will look like when everyone is ready to go. And the attack, the midfield, defense, and goalkeeping. Because it looks pretty good. But we did want to say Team Security Paul has been nice enough to join us here. This is from the PR department. Katia, we know it's your birthday. Oh we want to get and they brought you a sack of delicious donuts, which yes. I'm sure we will all be able to enjoy on here. Thank you. This is the podcast birthday edition. Look, you can see the oil popping out on the other end of the Oh my gosh. I fresh out of the oven I, donuts. I don't think I want to see that, but oh well. I was gonna say, but happy birthday, Katia. We're Thank so happy you. you're you're with us here and Thank helping us out. Spread all the good LA. word on LAFC. Are you gonna Thank take a bite you. of one? Yes from all of the LAFC okay. family. Thank you. Uh, I'm going to make a wish and then take a bite. <laughs> New tradition here at the Performance Center. She's wished for an MLS Cup. I know she did. <laughs> I'll put this over here. Really good. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> we should have done a little better with the wrapping. <laughs> it's a birthday edition here for Kathy. Kathy's going to get... You know, there's no, there's, on it. Thank you for the There's napkin. no clean getaways with donuts. And what happens is you get the sugar stuck here and you have to... Yeah, I'll have sugar all over him, but it's worth it. It is worth it. It is worth it. I'm very excited to talk about Monterrey and Liga MX because I, I know that's something that's near and dear to you and this League's Cup, if, in case you need a refresher, all 47 teams from uh, MLS and League's Cup, or MLS and Liga MX participating. We're down to eight. Six of them are from MLS. Two are from Liga MX. Only Monterrey, who beat 
Clásico Regio rivals Tigres in their round of 16 game down in Houston, which was a uh, quite a uh, celebration. Packed house there at Shell Energy Stadium and Querétaro. Surprising. Did you see? Some, I mean, some of this stuff before we get in there. Club América. I was broadcasting that Monterrey game, and I was watching Club América, and I saw them celebrate on the side view, and I go, and I said over the air, Club América is headed to the quarterfinals. And then 20 minutes go, what are you talking about? I go, oh. I did it 20 minutes later. I go, I saw it with my own eyes. I go, no, they didn't. They didn't explain to me what happened, and I thought it was going crazy. And I thought I invented it in my mind, so I was about to reach out to a psychiatrist, but I did see it. America celebrated, but then Nashville got another shot because uh, VAR, uh, there's been a lot of officiating, and it was the right call, but it did get involved. You're not crazy. The exact same thing happened to me. I was at BMO Stadium waiting for <laughs> LAFC's game to begin. So it I happened was, to a lot of so people. I was watching America's game on my phone, and then after that last PK, turn I off. turned it off. I'm like, okay, they're celebrating. Of course, America goes through, advances, and then I close my phone, and I start focusing because the LAFC game was about to start. And then another reporter like walks by, and then he's like, oh, yeah, America got eliminated. Same thing. I'm like, what are you talking about? I just saw it with my own eyes. They Thank were you. celebrating. Much better. They were celebrating. What are you talking about? And he's like, no, 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 no. They had to retake the PK and now they're eliminated. I'm like, what is happening? Uh, this so, is what yeah. happens with drama, VAR. Drama, drama. This is what happens with VAR. You got to watch a little longer. Yeah. You got to wait and go. Have my hey, thoughts on it, but. Is everything good? We're not going to like talk about that right now. Stamp the game. <laughs> Let's talk about what happened uh, on Tuesday at BMO Stadium. A scoreless first 45 minutes. It was also the return of Chicho Arango. Great moment to see him get his ring. Danny Masovsky, who scored a goal in their round of 16 or round of 32 game against Leon, was there too. He scored two goals. So it was a nice moment to see them. I, I, a lot of embraces as Chicho. And I'm sure he was emotionally drawn by that as well. But then uh, that game started. Uh, it was first 15, 20 minutes, LAFC were coming out hard, and they, they just they could be overwhelming. They didn't get the goal. They weren't able to execute. But it was just pretty it, – it set the table for me for what happened in, in the second half. As that first half progressed, RSL had a ver better moment, and they had really good chances that they missed. So LAFC was lucky there that uh, RSL couldn't, like – get on the score sheet first but I think that's that was really important that was the key something that I asked Steve at the end of the game just managing those different moments that's what the game is about so just being patient in that first half when like you said they were going at it things didn't go their way then the opponents started finding that moment creating chances and you held the zero went to that halftime break and then just came out refreshed. And then LFC does what they do best. They have the quality. They took advantage of the opponent's mistakes, capitalized. And then after they were they were able to score first and everything they just settled in everything felt great and then the goals kept on coming it sure did and look when you score 11 goals in two games we don't talk about the defense but you know john mccarthy gets another clean sheet Giorgio killini was a monster in a lot of plays from what i'm seeing and, and developing that I mean, we, we forget we didn't get to see you know aaron long has had an interrupted season uh to see him with killini and hopefully jesus Murillo together and the fullback plays because I think it's easy to say, hey, Danny Buwanga is the, the man of the match, but uh, De uh, Chiqui Palacios was named the man of the match. Uh, he, was very, uh, he was very active, got that cross in uh, on the Ordaz goal. And then you have Nathan Ordaz, and there's articles being written everywhere about the good young players in MLS that are 18, 19, 20. Brian Gutierrez, Diego Luna, Noel Buck. Uh, we're, we're pretty close to maybe throwing... Nate in there, if he can get the playing time, we'll talk about when everyone's healthy what it looks like, but seizing that opportunity. I mean, I would almost give him the nod because I saw some really nice plays, good first touches, but Steve Chironolo afterwards would say uh, it was a great game, but you can still tell he's a young player and he needs work. And that's very comforting because he's going to get that work. And then Philippe Fufu Krastev, who we were here on Monday announcing his arrival, doing his introductory press conference, Day later, he comes into the game and scores. I mean, those are all performances on if, uh, individually that were talk be about great. a debut. Talk about a debut. Just talk about everything clicking. But that's what uh, LAFCs look like here in League's Cup. That's why I mentioned that spark at the beginning of the podcast because you're seeing that all of those pieces clicking, the team is clicking. You're seeing them like enjoying, happy, just bringing those young guys in and 
for the leaders, the guys in those re leadership roles to just embrace them. You see how they celebrate. It's so happy for Nate when he scored that first goal last game. Now he scores again. And just how they're communicating and, and trying to make the best out of it. I think it's going to be really good. And for everybody's confidence. Who would have been, been your MVP of all those players? Of all those. Would you go with the stadium saying... Palacios, we've got Boanga, which maybe slip. I know. Of course, it's easy to to look at the score and say, okay, Boanga. Especially if you Try look Buanga. at the look at the last two games, new competition again, starting with the bang, five goals, two assists in in that span. Even Steve was joking about it. He's like, uh, I wish I could clone him That's and have like different Denise uh, on the field. What I understand, we're not far away from doing that. <laughs> uh, <laughs> so yes. He wishes he could have more Denise on the field, but like his impact, his leadership has been really important, especially when Carlos wasn't available for that game against RSL. I think it was great. He even said, is it better than Messi if we look at the stats? And at first you think, no, Messi has seven goals in four games. But if we look at the minutes, I even did the you math. Did, you broke it down. I broke it okay, down. Okay, so Denny Buanga is the right answer. I was trying okay, to be cute. Yes. He is the, 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 the man Buanga of the match. Denny is the right answer. So seven goals. In four games for Messi, a total of 294 minutes, oh, which means he's been scoring one goal every 42 minutes. It's a pretty good average. And then when we look at Denis, it's 166 minutes over two games, five goals. So it is one goal every 33 minutes. So to Chirondolo's point. So it's 41 minutes. 42. 42 for Messi. 33, 33 for Denis. So he's nine minutes better than Messi. <laughs> yes. Which I didn't think I'd be saying today, but here we are. So to Steve's point, yes, Bwonga has been better than Messi. We should be wearing far. shirts right now that says Bwonga, nine <laughs> minutes leagues, better than leagues, Messi. In Leagues Cup. Hashtag Leagues Cup. Hashtag Leagues Cup. <laughs> Just an idea. That's brilliant. For the I mean, PR uh, team. Uh, against... Well, you know, Juarez is uh, it's not one of the powerhouses, but we've seen what Querétaro can do. That they were, I, I love that game because you could see how amped they were for this moment. Uh, those players, that this was like their Super Bowl with the press conferences, and then LAFC smashes them. Real Salt Lake, I had been in a couple games out there, and I know they had circled this. This was that moment where they can get over the hump and show we have arrived. Got smashed as well, and it, it's a lot of things, and I, I want to. Because they look so much better, Katia. I want to go through what LAFC, because Carlos Vela, after the game, we don't have any updates. Um, neither does Steve Trinola when asked about his status. Uh, Mario Gonzalez, um, we don't know about his status either. But they'll be there eventually. So I'm going to go, we'll, we'll look at the options and how difficult, because we remember in May and June, injuries fixture congestion you know they had to find guys to play games and so many different players and we leaned into LAFC too and had to be very creative a lot of guys playing out of position but with everyone in position this is going to be a tough team to crack so I'm going to go through uh, and, and tell you tell me what sticks out so Vela, Buanga, Buk, uh, we're going to leave Bogus as a midfielder, uh, Ordaz and then Mario Gonzalez those are your five options for three positions Midfield would be Bogush. This is in no particular order, obviously. Ilya, Kellen, Tillman, who we're hoping to see at some point as well. He hasn't been ready to go, but you would imagine he will be at some point. Fufu Krastev. We've got to use that nickname a lot. Fufu. Fufu. He said we could, right? He greenlit that. Yuli, jump. We got it. Fufu it is. <laughs> Those are five. And, you, and even Eric Duenya, six guys who can get in that midfield. Defensively, Long, Chiellini. Uh, Daniel Maldonado, uh, Jesus Murillo, so the four center backs, Hollingshead, Chiqui Palacio, Sergi Palencia has played these games. He is back as well. So you have cover there. And then Maxime Crepo is back and John McCarthy. I know it's not going to be all perfect. I know I may have missed a name or two and I apologize, but that is pretty daunting. Is there something you look at if you had to figure out a strength that might, that might stick out there? The midfield is very powerful. That would, would have been my answer, the too. The depth is important. We saw how important that depth was last year, especially this moment in time. And we're going to be able to talk to John Thornton and, and go more in depth about it. But it was really important for them to fill those spaces after losing someone like Jose Cifuentes, Mahala, 
and just having that depth again, players that could come and contribute in like specific positions. And I know that everybody wanted to see sometimes like those big names like we saw during the last summer transfer window when all eyes were here at LAFC with Killini and Gareth Bale and it's not like they didn't try. Uh, those, I, I, those I forgot Christian to... Oliveira, Kike Oliveira. The Oliveira, yeah, I was about saying, to say when it comes to attack. That was a name I forgot, but we haven't seen him. Another youngster. There's big plans for him. Signing that can come and, and contribute as well. So that that was important. And even though there might not be those big names that, that you're thinking of, of those elite players coming in from Europe that had important careers, these are young players, very talented, as we've seen, that have that experience and then and that can fit right in into LAFC's style of play, identity, and just personality overall. I, you, you hit it on the, the head there because, you know, when clubs are making seismic moves because player is available, we've always talked to Steve Chirinello and John Thorrington about they have their guys, they have a process, and they get their targets. And I think they got that here with not just Gonzalez, Krastev, but also Oliveira. Very excited to see what those guys can contribute Let's move on to the quarterfinals. Friday night at the Rose Bowl. Uh, get, get your tickets at LUC.com. It's a tough turnaround. And I know Monterey's had it very difficult. They're down in Houston, and they're going to probably fly, and they're, they're probably in L.A. now, and they're going to get very little training. It's very difficult for these Liga MX teams. We are well aware of that. Uh, they're going to draw well. I don't know what it's going to look like with the short notice, but it's going to be, obviously, BMO Stadium is uh, occupied at the time, so it goes to the Rose Bowl. But... Uh, it almost feels like if you were going to use the Rose Bowl for a fixture, this would be kind of it. And this is the biggest game. All due respect to Lionel Messi. This is the biggest game of the tournament. You have the team that won MLS Cup. You have the team that finished first in the Clausura tournament. A team that has won a ton of trophies, mostly in the last 10 to 15 years. Uh, tell me a little bit, because you, you've been close to Liga MX and the role that Monterrey play uh, as they beat Tigres, their city rivals, the role that they play in, in Mexico. Because right now, they're holding the flag for the league. I mean, all the other teams, America, Chivas, Tigres, Leon, the Toluca, Pumas, they're all back home. They're holding the flag, they're definitely. They're holding the flag. Monterrey, one of the powerhouses of Liga MX. They have the capital. They invest. They heavily invest on signings, players. Even though there's always this debate about the teams from the capital in Mexico City, that history of like America, Cruz Azul, Pumas, and then in Guadalajara, of course, you have Chivas too. And now you look at what in Monterrey the teams have done there, especially in the past few years, with Tigres and Rayados, the signings that they've had and the trophies that they've won, but people still say like, oh, the, the only people that care about Tigres That's and crazy. Monterrey are like in the uh, north of Mexico. It's not like the tradition when we look at like Cruz Azul in America and so and so. So there's a debate always in Mexico, like, oh, nobody cares I, about those teams, but the, the reality I'm surprised things, that, I mean, the big picture, they, I know that they haven't embraced that more because that's an exciting development that you have this epicenter of teams in Mexico City and Guadalajara. Then you have this powerhouse in the north, in Monterrey, which is not too far from the U.S. border. You can get there 400 miles to Texas. Or I yes. don't know why they have embraced that more. I'm sure they have, but that's the perception we keep hearing. Yes, it's a thing in, in Mexico. Thing. It is. There's like how, the way also the fan bases fight over like what team is more relevant and like what team is more popular, uh, just rating wise, and who are you gonna watch? Ratings. Things like that about like. El Clásico Nacional, when it's like America against Chivas, and then El Clásico Regio, when it's Monterrey against Tigres, and it's always like, oh, nobody cares about El Clásico Regio, only people in Monterrey. So, I mean, just the fun stuff. But looking at the roster, looking at the team that they have, it's a great team to be holding the flag for Liga MX because they're a dangerous opponent. They have so much talent in every line. Now that attack with... Funes Mori and Canales that just signed, left Spain to come to Monterrey. He's the one that scored the PK against Tigres to big money move. Yes, to make it so that the the team could make it to the next round. Then you ha you have players that have so much experience on defense, midfield, the creation, and then LA. It's going to be a challenge for LAFC because it's a different team than what they face and what they regularly faced in MLS. So it's a team that knows how to defend really well, that knows how just to be patient, waiting in the back, counterattack. So LAFC likes to have those plays in open space. Monterrey, they're going to grind. They're going to fight. They're not going to give you a lot of space. So that's going to be something important and a challenge for sure. 
Uh, they have old man Hector Moreno back there. Yes. Who, uh, Played, Moreno, three World Cups. John Estefan Medina, Gallardo. I, I, I did the game. I like that Medina a lot. Very He's athletic. Colombian. It felt like Moreno was the He can old be dog a center there. back. He and can be Medina. a full back. They're not going to make mistakes. And we've seen that. Uh, and, well, Steve Chirinolo, I think, was your question after the game. I think he hit he nailed that team as well. He goes, the thing about them is they don't have any weaknesses. So you don't sit there and you go, okay, Rogelio Funes Mori's a great player. He's not going to scare too many people. Canales maybe a little bit more. Uh, they lost Germán Berterame, who had scored five goals, just like uh, uh, Denny Buanga. Uh, so he is out. That's a big loss, but it didn't affect them as they got by Tigres. Um, they can adapt. And it's like a, you look at the roster, good, good. But that together... Very, there is no weaknesses. So Steve uh, Chirinola has already done his homework on this one. Yes, and one of the things about Monterrey and the issues that they've had with other coaches was also like that defensive style. And because of the talent that they have, they wanted to see a team that would go forward more, that would create more opportunities. And that's what they were looking for with Tan Ortiz signing. Tan Ortiz, of course, that used to be with America. He faced LAFC as America's coach. There was a little bit of controversy as well during that press conference. Remember that summer showing at SoFi Stadium last year? And I asked Tan Ortiz about, well, facing LAFC right now, the, the signings that they've had, just what does it mean? And then he... I mean, dismissed it a little bit, saying like, oh, I don't know much about the team. I just focus, yeah. you know, like he didn't know much about LAFC at the moment. <laughs> he was just focusing on his team. I get it. He has to Do you coach. believe him? <laughs> Did you believe I don't him back know. then? I don't know if it was just like a PR stunt or like I, maybe he genuinely didn't know. And then they yeah. had him like friendly. briefed. That, yeah, it was a friendly and they had it briefed him about the team at the time. Could be. But I'm sure he does know now. And it will be a completely different thing in preparation for this upcoming match. Yeah, a lot of folks in Liga, the, the Liga MX supporters are are angry. They're saying it's it's been tilted towards Messi, and then the officiating hasn't been up to stuff well, and the travel, and you know, welcome to MLS, guys. This is I can tell you three or four times LAFC been stuck in an airport, uh, not being able to get to their destination. We don't hear about it because that's kind of commonplace. Although, uh, all due respect, because Liga MX play teams have done a I've done. Very, I've had to challenge this, and I, I I don't know if this will make them. When we have League's Cup next year, how they're going to approach it? I mean, how does how does it taste of what it was like in the U.S. and how maybe this or how this tournament changes a bit? How how League of Mexico changes? I think they're not going to like it. They're not going to like going back if Monterrey gets knocked out. They're not going to like going back and hearing it from the Mexican press because we I've, I've had my ear to the grindstone to hear what they've been saying on those. Shows that air on, on both sides of the border, um, like ESPN Deportes, Fox Deportes, and uh, they're letting him have it. So uh, it, a big responsibility for Monterrey. The Mexican clubs knew it was going to be a challenge, that wor like World Cup format where they, they were going to be away from home for many weeks, playing in different stadiums, traveling, and they didn't know how everything was just going to unravel. That was one of like the questions going into this tournament and one thing that they were they will for sure have to analyze like after the tournament is over how are you going to go about it in the future and even like Pablo last night RSL's coach was saying like well I think one of the reasons why we're seeing all of like the Mexican teams being knocked out or not what we expected right now in these rounds what where we only have Monterrey and Querétaro left has to do maybe with the conditions that they're not used to, they're playing away, they're having to travel. Like you said, welcome to MLS. Yes, yeah. but they're not in MLS. They're, they're not, in the they're MX. Some of the but travel going, that they this, have to This is do, really hard. Some of the games, they go by bus because it's like a two-hour drive to the next city where they're playing. So it's definitely different, the conditions. And it, it's been a challenge for, for those teams. Yeah. I know uh, the surface has been brought up in Monterrey, Los Berterame on the artificial surface of Portland. Tigres played... Uh, at Vancouver, I think Tijuana has an artificial track in yes. Liga Mekis, but that's about it. No one else in the first division, so a, a lot to get used to. But I want to say this before we get ready to talk to John Thorrington. Uh, LAFC, part of uh, their growth was being able to challenge Liga Mekis. So in 2020, they played León twice, and that opened up for the mini tournament where they played Cruz Azul, América, and Tigres. 2023... Or 2022, they played Club América, as you mentioned. In 2023, they will have played Juárez. They would have played Monterrey, played León twice again. 
uh, play Pachuca later in the year in the uh, Campeones Cup. That's a nice I'm little... play Tigres. Tig Tigres. Sorry, Tigres. Campeones Cup, yes. Uh, that's a lot. Tigres who beat Pachuca. Yes. That's a lot of... Uh, that's a, 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 a good taste and a good chance to... Uh, build connections, which I think is very important because we saw that in 2020 when they played Leon. That's only good for the club. So it's, uh, to me, a blessing that in this round of eight, they get Monterrey. LAFC get the big challenge. It's definitely great for the team, for their aspirations, so that they can keep on growing, seeing how they measure up to the Mexican teams, teams, as we said, that have really good players that are talented that have been working with a certain idea and a certain culture for a long time so that can only be beneficial for this team in its journey we'll see it very excited friday night get out to the rose bowl to check out lafc and Monterrey. it is a big time fixture maybe the biggest one in leagues cup when we return we're going to talk to the man in charge general manager co-president of lafc john thorrington we'll talk about the game against Real Salt Lake, playing in League's Cup, and how this roster projects for the rest of 2023 inside LAFC with the birthday girl, Katia Castrena, Max Pretos. Rate, review, download, subscribe, and tell a friend. John Thorrington, a regular here on Inside LAFC podcast, co-president and general manager joins us. Always good to have you, though. Pleasure to be here. We hit the reset button, and we'll we'll, we'll talk. I, I just want to, because we, we've seen these two games of the League's Cup, and we'll talk about a few things that are affecting the club and how it moves forward. Uh, but the performances that you've seen, uh, we know getting some rest, getting healthy in some situations, um, refreshing things around here, all part of it. How have you seen it, have seen the team go from not being able to score goals to scoring 11 in two games? Yeah, look, I think it was the response and level of performance we were all hoping for coming out of a period in which we were frustrated by our levels of performance our results and just how we were playing it was painful at times to watch it felt looked as though our team was just limping through games but i, I think for us what we focused on was what we could control obviously the the idea was to do as best we could we as best we can throughout that first phase of the season dealing with Champions League Open Cup and and what have you and I think to come out of that phase still in a competitive position in the West and obviously we're picky we'd love to be in first place and never have lost a game but I felt like that was actually a remarkable achievement of the guys given what they had to face and so the uptick in performance not just because of of rest but also actual training time I think uh, the number of training days real training days we had in that first part of the season was like 15, 16 sessions. So for the coaches to be able to really get the guys back on the field, work on the things they saw, and then I do think the biggest thing was just that rest mentally, physically that the players got. The one fear that you do have is anytime a team goes through a dip, it's really easy to say, oh, okay, you know what they're capable of, it'll come back, but sometimes <laughs> we're human. Yeah. And sometimes dips in form affect your confidence in different ways. So we're certainly knew that this was a predictable pattern given what what we faced but did not take for granted that it was just going to be uh rest and then here we go uh in these two games how having said that certainly grateful that the results have matched some fantastic performances coming out of that break john think about the quarterfinals Monterrey, one of the powerhouses in, in Liga MX, great players, lots of quality. Just what are the expectations when we look at that game and what the matchup is going to be against LAFC? Yeah, for me, I think we played a fantastic León team in the Champions League final. And we know we know what we're up against. That that León team is, well, is different from the León team, even the León sure. team now. Uh, but it's a different type of team. I think that that Leon team was youthful and energetic, and was a you know had had a very clear system and a passionate way of playing. This Monterey team is different, and we've faced some of these teams before in the past. We played the Americas, we played Cruz Azul, uh, we played Tigres. It's a different type of team in their not just their status, but what that status brings them is spending power. So they have a different profile of players. So they have phenomenal players in every position that uh, will certainly pose a, a strong test for us, but one I think we're ready for, and um, you know, I certainly think I, I, I hold our players up against any team in this competition, and, and grateful we're coming into form 
at the right time. But to answer your question, phenomenal team. We've never played against them. I'm expecting what I hope will be a great environment at the Rose Bowl on Friday. And it, as I say, it will be a, will be a big challenge for us, but one I think we're up for. Uh, the League's Cup, I'm going to double barrel question you here so I can get them both in. Obviously, uh, just e expanding from playing Monterrey, but the importance for you and LAFC of getting to play Liga MX teams in games that mean something and your expectations for the League's Cup and having seen games and been involved with LAFC, how the expectations and the reality kind of connected or, or how close are they? Yeah, so to start with regards to international competition, I absolutely love it. I think. Obviously, for us as a club, one of our preeminent goals is always to be playing in Champions League, and we just love those experiences to really test ourselves against the region's best. We This year, we had Alajuelense, which was an awesome experience to go down to, to Costa Rica. Then we played the two MLS teams and then finished against Leon. So we got a, sort of a mix of both, uh, similar to what we faced now in, in Leagues Cup with Juarez, Salt Lake, and now Monterrey. And I think... Look, I, I really love that challenge because it's the the different, the cultural experience we won't necessarily get because we're playing at home, but the the, the clash of styles and, and the leagues, I think, just brings out something a little bit different that I really love to see. Um, you know, the way the tournaments played out sometimes, you know, the fact that Tigres Monterey played against each other while we played against Salt Lake, something you can't control for, but I really look forward to the challenge of playing a Mexican giant like like Monterrey and I think to your second question the expectations of League's Cup I think have been mine have been exceeded I think we were always sort of curious to see how the teams would approach it I think you've seen it's very competitive every team has gone in it wanting to win these games and, and giving everything they have I think we've certainly benefited from Messi mania coinciding with this tournament which has been fantastic for the league for the tournament as well and so for us it was, you know, coming off of this break, we wanted to make sure that we got back to the LAFC we know as quickly as possible, and that hopefully will continue Friday. Focusing on this summer transfer window, we were talking about it. Players like Mahala and Cifuentes left the club, but when you were looking for what was needed in certain positions with Mario, Philip, who had a great debut with yeah. goal, <laughs> talk about having a great debut, and then Oliveira, just what those players bring to the table and to what the team needed th at this moment. Sure, so I think as we prepared for this window, frankly, I'll just be honest, if you would have said to me in January how busy would I predict the summer window to be, I actually wasn't expecting mm -hmm. it to be as active as it was, but we always have contingency plans in place, and once we made the decisions on Mahala, made the decisions on, on Cifuentes. That was at least two players that we needed to replace. So positionally, we brought in Krastev to play in a midfield, but in a slightly different way than Sifu would. Um, and then Oliveira was a key addition that we felt will give us some of that dynamic attacking play that Mahala brought. And then aside from those two, we did identify uh, Mario as a number nine, a central striker, was a profile of player that we didn't have as we started the season. And I use every game almost like a data point as to what we feel like the team will need to then succeed, like we did last year um, coming into this window. What do we feel like we need to succeed? That was slightly different. I think we were in first place, and I think people it raised some eyebrows, the amount of activity, but we as a staff felt, look, this team is doing great, but it still needed a bit more to then succeed. When you make changes, sometimes you have a bit of turbulence as you start, but we were confident and convicted that that was what was needed to succeed last year, and that process was similar as we went into this window. And I know I've spoken to you before about guys that fit this club, and those guys across the board were seamless. Yeah. And we've already seen that with have you called him by Fufu yet? That is his nickname? Is it Philip or do you call him Fufu? Because I, I will never call him Fufu. <laughs> that's hard to resist, yes, John. It's like a cat's pet name. I'm not going to call him Fufu. Uh, Max really wants it to stick. No, I want it to stick. I'll leave it with you. I'm not going to help you on that one. No, what a fantastic debut. Ever since he's been here, he's just played with a smile on his face. You can see how much he's enjoyed it. There's a really nice moment in the locker room afterwards where he got his game ball and the guys rallying around him. And I do think, as you say, the last year and in years past and i think one thing we pride ourselves on is make sure we do our diligence that the player but 
just as importantly, if not more importantly, the, the person fits in with LAFC, and, and we feel confident that these three new additions will be the same. Right. Speaking of youngsters, and we have to focus also on the work that's being done with the academy, these young players that are being brought into the team. And then we see Nate, who yeah. scored his first goal last game. He scored again. What are you seeing from those young guys, and how special is it to just see it come to fruition? Yeah, well, someone shared this, and I, I hope it's not uh, – if it's not in under copyright yet, it should be. Um, and this will be a PG-13 audience, hopefully. But I, somebody shared yeah. something with me that – uh, after he scored, they had an orgasm, <laughs> which I thought was... I would not expect that to come out I, of your lips, John. I man. thought that was amazing. Um, so, uh, no, I think for me, I, I would not necessarily have phrased it that way. But for us, it's amazing. I was just at a meeting with the academy staff and just the collective pride they can take in players like him and Dwayne, yes, and others that are contributing in a real way. But, you know, speaking specifically of Nathan, that's two goals in two games uh, got you know a start the uh, the other night or last last night um, and uh, and took his chance and that's what you ask you you know they, they prepare from when they're kids in our academy for those moments and then it's not always easy to take the chances and he's certainly uh, done so in the last two games with his performances and um, you know he I think the coaches do a great job with these young players of instilling the, the principles into them and that goal he scored is LAFC game model page one, how he ran and, and, and made that finish. And uh, certainly really, really happy for, for him and his family. And filling out that LAFC 2 roster, going crossing uh, the Atlantic to fill that, uh, that roster as well. I, I think we all feel a lot of pride in seeing that because that's a real – I mean, that was here before the club was, building that academy and getting the, the pipeline going. And it's got to, I mean, from that point to there, it's got to feel like uh, the flow is good. The flow is good yeah. when you're seeing guys like Eric and Nathan. For sure. And I think, Max, for the first time, there are no gaps between our, in our, within our programming. And I think it was a function of how we started with a group of 12-year-olds. And then there's a gap to the first team. And then we started a second team. But that's still a bit of a, a gap too far. And now I feel like what we're seeing at with LAFC 2 and the first team in our academy is now we actually have a full pipeline and pathway for for players to go step by step. And I think um, that we're starting to see uh, the fruit of all the labor that's gone in since 2016 when we started our academy with players like Eric Duenas who are now at an age and, and have learned and developed to the point where they can contribute at the highest level. Of course, there's always a lot of expectations when it comes to signings, those big names, elite players coming from Europe. Is that something that LAFC still has in mind? And it's a team, of course, where they're always throwing names of interest around certain players. But is, is that something that fits the, the style and the model, also bringing those players in? At yeah, some point? certainly. I think we always talk about representing LA and part of LA is it's a city of stars and so we've never shied away from that we've always had players like Carlos Gareth Giorgio I think what we also combine that with is we just talked about creating our own heroes which are there Dwayne yes is and that that's also a big part of it so it's, it's a combination of two um, I, I appreciate that you didn't ask specifics of these to get a question ahead I kid. no we are in conversations with players like that i think there are sort of three three categories one is absolute nonsense one is yes we're talking to them <laughs> but it's not realistic or it's actually a realistic conversation um the only way you can actually tell is at the end if we actually do sign them um but we we certainly are looking at every option to make this team better i think our owners have shown that when the right opportunities present themselves we manage our budgets and things in a way that we can be opportunistic. Katya asks the tough questions. That's why she's here. I, I do the softballs. You know me, John. I'm just kidding. Hey, are you, are you getting locked into this messy mania? I mean, you might get. You're definitely going to get him possibly September. Maybe. I mean, there's this we definitely have. We Leagues we Cup definitely possibly. will have. We'll be hosting September 3rd. Messi for me is the greatest player that's ever played the game. Um, I have, you know, I, I that's not a statement. I say lightly that is absolutely it's a uh, strong one he's unique and i think it's been absolutely incredible i think the energy that he brings and i think what is so gratifying to see um is i don't think you can fake this thing these things but he looks just like he's really enjoying it and i think 
he is showing the quality of this league because I don't think he's sort of playing in second gear. Um, he is who he is. I think Giorgio had a quote where, like, if this is surprising to you, he's literally done it at every club he's ever been at in every competition. Um, but I think it's amazing for the league and the energy he's brought, and I think he is showing and opening people's eyes around the world to what this league is and the, the level of competition that you can have, the environments that we have in our stadiums, and, and really showing how far this league has come that we can handle a player like him. Fantastic. Uh, I, I agree with you. It's been an, it, the immersion has been immediate, and we're seeing what he's capable of, and maybe there is a League's Cup final. They're on the opposite sides of the bracket, but they're only two wins away from possibly doing that. John, we always appreciate you hitting us with your knowledge and joining us here on the podcast. Always a pleasure. All right. Thank Katya, you. as always, it's her birthday, too. So Happy we wish birthday. Thank on, you. She's on her I way. I don't know whether you the saw the 98th birthday celebration that was at the yes, stadium last night. Yeah, at the stadium, I saw That's it. my wife's grandpa. Oh, oh, that's so nice. Give, us her, give, him, uh, her, give him her it's, best, please. It's Papa Bill. He turned 98 Papa yesterday. Bill, happy birthday. Yes. <laughs> Hello, Leo. <laughs> We're happy. It's just a happy, happy birthday edition of Inside LAFC. We'd like to thank John Thorrington for Katia and Max Inside LAFC podcast. Get it where you get all your podcasts. Rate, review, download, subscribe, tell a friend. We'll see you again with a complete wrap-up of the League's Cup quarterfinal matchup from the Rose Bowl.